Hello and welcome to Funds Focus. This is one of our seminars on capital protected products. This is following on from the recent investment uh, seminars we did in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. And it's really just to, to allow those that weren't able to attend to get access to some of the information that we had at those, uh, at those seminars. Okay, before we start, there's a, a disclaimer I've just got to run through with you. Uh, really, it's just to tell you that the presentation that um, that we're looking at at the moment is designed as gen to provide you with general information only. Uh, we don't. Uh, it shouldn't be con construed as um, professional advice or personal advice specific to your circumstances. And that uh, before you take into account, uh, before you act on any of this information, uh, you should obtain professional advice and read the PDS before you make an investment. I'm Suleiman Ravel, I'm the Managing Director at Wealth Focus. I will run through with you the different capital protected structures uh, that are typically used out there in the market and provide you with a guide in terms of differentiating between those products and how to compare them. Just to give you a bit of background on ourselves, uh, Funds Focus, we are the uh, discounted investment newsletter uh, primarily targeting investors that are looking to make their own investment decisions we also offer a full advice service uh, but we just don't do that on a, a discounted basis uh, the service that we provide typically will rebate 100 percent of entry fees on investments and on top of that uh, we we run with a panel of uh, around 16 different providers uh, where we give you cash back on the management fees so that really comes from the trailing commissions that we receive uh, if we receive anything we get over $400 a year we'll rebate back to you as an investor okay so moving on to capital protection um, I suppose when I originally looked at uh, protection a couple of years ago, I did start to think to myself, well, why would you invest in a capital protected product when the markets have already, um, uh, when the markets have fallen? Or, or what, in fact, at that time, why would you invest in a capital protected product when the markets are, are, are high as, as uh so moving on to capital protection. I suppose the first question you've got to ask yourself is why would you invest in a capital protected product? I mean at, at the end of the day the markets are relatively low right now than they were say two years ago and um, at the end of the day uh, you are inevitably paying for the pleasure of having some protection within your within your product um, so why would you pay for something when the markets are so low when the likelihood is that you will never need that protection to fall back on. And really this comes down to the psychology of, uh, of investing and how we make our investment decisions. I'll just run through a couple of examples with you. If you think about, um, uh, in fact I suppose everyone's familiar with how the market, uh, market moves and um, the types of emotions that we have during that period. Uh, People generally are very, very happy to, to be investing in the markets at, at this point as the market's rising. And so you won't see anybody who's uh, who's pulling out their investment from the markets at this time. It's really as, as the market starts turning, starts coming down in value, that people start worrying about, uh, uh, about whether that investment is going to produce a return for them. And at this point, when we're, we're, we're in, this, in the cycle, um, people around us are, are kind of reassuring us that um, their investment investment will come good. It's part and parcel how the markets work. Uh, markets go up, markets come down. And regardless, as the market continues to drop, we see people around us pulling their money out of the market and it does make us question whether or not this is the right thing to do. And what we tend to find is that investors will buy in at this point. It's very easy to speak to investors about putting money into the markets at this point. And at this time, people are wondering whether or not they should be pulling money out of the markets. And what typically happens is that regardless of how logical you are in your thinking, you think, okay, well, this is a good time to be buying into the markets. 
um, buying shares at those lower prices we inevitably look at selling out at this point and so what we see is investors buying in at the top and selling at the bottom and capital protection is really one way of allowing you to pull away from that in that you don't have to to worry when the markets have fallen in value So just having a look at how we behave as, uh, as humans in our investment decisions, I'll just give you an example here. I'll give you the choice between two, two scenarios, both offering you the opportunity to profit. Choice A it gives you an 80% chance to win $4,000. Alternatively, you can opt for choice B. Choice B is, given, is, is certain, 100% chance you'll definitely get your $3,000 um, uh, you'll definitely get a three thousand dollar return, uh, but choice A, you've only got a one in five chance of not getting anything at all. So which would you go for? Would you go for three thousand dollars in your hand today, or would you opt for taking a chance? Uh, four out of five would give you a great amount, four thousand and one in five chance of not getting anything at all. And what we tend to find is that people will actually err on the side of caution and go for that certainty. Three thousand dollars in my hand today. Okay, well let's let's just um, switch that around. And let's just say, uh, give you a choice of two scenarios. Both um, providing you with uh, possibility of a loss. Choice B this time is going to give you a, th a, a certain $3,000 loss. Choice A on the other hand will give you an 80% chance of a $4,000 loss but at the same time a 1 in 5 or 20% chance of only losing, uh, sorry, of, of losing nothing. So which would you rather go for? Would you rather roll the dice and uh, in the hope that you might not lose your four thousand dollars or would you take a certain three thousand dollar loss and what we tend to find there is that people will actually uh, move the, the other way so people actually uh, are willing to gamble to, to avoid that loss um, it's the same it's actually the same scenario we just change it changes it around the, the other way around Okay, so then let's have a look at what investors really do in the markets. Um, we look at the US share market between April 98 and April 2006. And we look at US mutual flows over that same period, which are um, uh, mutual funds are, are managed funds, um, as they're known over in the US. So if we look at uh, the markets between 98 and 2000 when we had a, a bull run and you look at the, the mutual fund flows over that time, the managed fund inflows, you can see that there's money actually going into the markets. Investors are very happy to put their money into the markets over that period. After that we hit a, we'd hit a bear run um, and over that same period if we look at how mutual fund flows went, so managed funds, Client, investors actually started taking their money out of the markets over that period um, so kind of uh, the reverse of what you should be doing um, so what we're seeing is money going into the markets as the markets are rising and as the markets are falling money coming out of the markets so just in, and then also if you look at the uh, comparison of what investors have actually done with their money. Um, disciplined strategy of just leaving the money in the markets would have uh, given investors 11.8% a year return. But the reality is that investors actually put money in at the top, pulled out at the bottom, and only got 4.3% a year. So that's really illustrating that the long-term performance depends a lot more on, on how investors are behaving rather than how the underlying investments are behaving. And this is where protective products have come into play is that it pulls away that emotive uh, response of um, worrying about your money on a day-to-day -day basis and pulling it out of the markets at the wrong time. 
Okay, so moving on to the different types of capital protected products that there are in the market. Um, vast majority of these products uh, that are currently available can fall into one of two categories. I'd say somewhere in the region around 95% of the products are out there um, would either be a bond and call type protected product or a CPPI, or sometimes known as threshold managed type capital protected product. If you understand these two structures, I think you'll understand the vast majority of products out there. So let's have a look at um, uh, bond and call products and how that provides you with some protection. So bond and call as the name suggests is made up of two parts as the bond element and the call option side of it. The bond uh, is really think of it as a term deposit um, from $100,000 invested roughly speaking over five years I would expect somewhere in the region about sixty or sixty-five thousand dollars of that to go and sit into think of it as a term deposit um, which will give back to you over five years a hundred thousand dollars so if you think about that that is uh, that's really where your protection comes from uh, the other side of it you could actually go and do whatever you like with that investment you can go and play roulette you could have a roulette capital protected product um, because at the end of the day regardless what happens to this you know that you're going to get back a hundred dollars um, uh, of, of your investment or sorry, a hundred thousand dollars in the example I gave of your investment. The other side of it is uh, is a call option, um, and what easiest way of understanding what a call option is is basically that gives you the right to uh, the gains on an underlying um, investment. So if the investment falls in value, um, you don't lose anything. Um, so your call option would be worth nothing at the end. You'd rely on your uh, protected part, the the term deposit side. Um, but if it goes up in value, uh, you've got access to, to the upside. So, for example, for $40,000, you could get 100,000 notional exposure, i.e. you get the upside as though you had put 100,000 of your own money in. So let's say the SX is 4,500 at the moment. And over five years, that's grown to say nine thousand, so it's doubled in value. So if you'd put a hundred thousand of your own money into that, that'd be worth two hundred thousand today, and you've made a hundred thousand dollar profit. Okay, with with an option, it's different. You don't need to put anything down. You just got to pay them an upfront premium. And say, let's say, forty thousand um, dollar is what the cost of that is to you, uh, and that gives you that notional hundred thousand. So if the uh, market's doubled as this as this has, your profit at maturity will be a hundred thousand dollars. Hopefully that makes sense. And so the the returns on the um, bond and call products really comes from this call option. How to compare those? Uh, how to compare the different products? We'll come on to in in a moment. But um, that's just really to give you an idea of the basics behind bond and call. The other one that you see a lot of the time is uh, CPPI or threshold managed um, products and, and that really comes down to um, managing an investment so that as you start off with 100% in a uh, in a in managed fund and as the um, product falls in value, so let's say the markets have, have taken a turn for the worse, as the fund starts falling in value is really a structured way of um, moving your money out of the markets as it's falling and then once the market's starting to recover again and the investment starts going up in value that they switch some of the money back from cash and back into um, back into the stock market this is uh, this is a chart that you'll see a lot of the time in the, the PDS's so this is really just illustrating what I was saying to you about um, uh, about the portfolio value so as it's falling down in value it hits the sell trigger they sell and put some into cash and as it goes back up in value they put they sw they move back from cash and put it back into the the, um, the stock market so again if you just have a look at the um, protection floor here this is really illustrating to you look regardless they know that any one time there is a there's a notional or a theoretical value that they need to have this could be 
Um, at this point you'd have to switch everything into cash to make sure that we're going to give you $100 back at maturity. So switch everything into term deposits at this point to give you $100 back at maturity for the $100 that you've um, initially put in. Okay. So why would we use a CPPI product over a bond and call product? Um, and I think uh, I think for the vast majority of people, the easiest way of thinking of this is that bond and call products, call options are traded on the market, and they're ty you'll typically see them over an index like the ASX 200 or the FTSE 100 or the Hang Seng index. Um, that's a real uh, precursor in terms of what what the type of protection is. Um, CPPI products you typically see over over managed funds. Um, and the reason being that you don't see bond and call structures over a managed fund is that if you think about it, um, if a fund manager was able to go and buy a call option over his own um, investment fund, he could in theory manipulate how his investments are performing so that he could benefit from uh, the call options on the market. Um, and so this is really why you saw CPPI uh, structures being, um, uh, being developed. Um, as a way of allowing clients to to get protection over managed fund investors, uh, sorry, managed uh, funds. Uh, level of participation, um, I'd say, is is really a, an, an important factor on this type of product. Um, what you see with CPPI, uh, vast majority of cases, you'll see that it starts off at a hundred percent, and if there's any falls in the market or the investment. Uh, that you will have less than 100% at any one time. So um, it's because, sorry, 100% in, in equities. So it, some in that instance, you'd have had some being switched into cash. With bond and calls, uh, they basically give you 100% um, exposure. I typically expect to see 100% exposure to 150% uh, exposure. And really what they're saying to you is, look, whatever the market did over that period of time, if it's 150% exposure, um, so let's say the market doubled in value, uh, we'll give you one and a half times uh, times that. If it went up by 50% over that time, then we'll give you a 75% return. Um, so th yeah, so th this is where this is where you see um, a bit of a disparity between the products. Cost, however, uh, is also a factor to take into account. Uh, generally speaking, I'd say CPPI products are, are actually a little bit cheaper because they're actually not having to go out there and and buy a call option with uh, uh, with the money. They're they're actually just moving you out of the market when it seems a when it's falling and tends to be riskier, and um, moving you back in uh, once the market's recovered and seems like it's uh, it's on the way back up. Um, bond and call products because uh, because they've got um, Intrinsically, they they've got a higher exposure to the market. Um, I'd expect to see the cost being a little bit higher. Okay, so when we're looking at um, comparing uh, the same structures, what to look for? Um, bond and call uh, products are um, so. Let's say you're looking at uh, two offers from two different providers. They're both you've recognised that they're both bond and call. Well, how do I compare them? Then it's not the same way as comparing a managed fund, where you see that one fund manager is charging you one percent a year, the other one's charging you two percent a year, um, and, and therefore uh, it, it's easy to see. Okay, well I'm paying a little bit more. Am I getting uh, better performance as as a result of that? Um, bond and call structures, call options can have lots of uh, different features on that. And so um, you just need to be aware of these when you when you're comparing the products. Okay, so as uh, w one of the things we alluded to earlier was uh, participation rates. So if you're looking at one product and they're saying to you, okay, you got 100% participation, i.e., if the market doubles in value, your investment doubles in value. Um, another one might say to you, uh, we'll give you 150% exposure. Uh, then so that's saying to you, if the market, if yours uh, uh, if your investment doubles in value, um, 
the underlying investment doubles in value, then your investment has actually gone up by three times because they've given you an extra 50%. So when you're looking at that, that's obviously a, a big, uh, uh, a big thing. One, that one's going to give you one that's 100. I've got an example here of averaging. So taking our example be, uh, that we showed before, 4,500 up to 9,000. What they do within averaging is that they, they take various points along the way there. So it might be the last six months or so. And say, look, we'll look at what the um, underlying investment was doing. At, say, uh, monthly intervals. And we'll average that out over, uh, over that six months or five months on the way out there. The reason you'd have that, or the reason that you'd look to, to have that within a product, is to give you a bit of protection on the way out. Think about if the market had, uh, had just taken a tank, uh, a, a tanked on the way out there, and fallen from 9,000, or just below 9,000, down to 8,000 um, at maturity. You wouldn't be too happy with, uh, with your investment if he's done that. But if you've been averaged along the way there, then you'll see that um, uh, you get um, the average of the last few months, not just the final value that you've got on the way out. So that's, uh, that's a good thing to have within a product. And I'd be surprised not to see that within a product. However, the one thing to look out for is averaging on the way in. So this is something that you see within some of the products. And there's a way of making the products a little bit cheaper for the provider as well. Um, the reason that you'd typically avoid averaging on the way in, or, or well, not necessarily avoid it, but um, I suppose you'd uh, not favor it, is that when you're investing money into the markets, you're typically investing because you feel that now is a good time to be investing your money. And so if you're unaware of this and you've invested into this type of structure, uh, the market might uh, go up significantly or the investment might go up significantly in bit over the next six months. Um, and you're happy because you think your investment's gone up in value, when in reality you've actually just got the average point on the way in. So um, just something to, to watch out for there. Okay, and then capped returns. So again, you might see this within some of the products that they say to you, okay, well, we'll give you, um, get, going back to the example I gave you, 100% versus 150% participation. So you might go, okay, well, 150% is uh, a lot more attractive. But then when you look at it again, you might realize that actually it's 150%, but they're going to cap you at an overall return of, say, 50% over the over the five years or over the or or twenty percent a year each year, um, so that's you know what what they're giving you in one hand, they may be taking away in another. So just be aware of that. And again, it's a way of making making the products a bit cheaper. Volatility overlay, uh, we're starting to see this within products. It's nothing. It's not necessarily something to shy away from. Uh, volatility overlay is um, uh, is really a way of uh, adding a bit of risk. Uh, risk management to your product. Uh, volatility is perceived as being a precursor to um, uh, to falls in the market. There's a saying in um, in the investment world of uh, up by the stairs, down by the elevator. And so you tend to see the markets going up gradually, and uh, before they before they have their their big falls. And Typically, what you see towards the top end of uh, of the markets is volatility starts increasing. So, uh, another way of thinking of volatility is the the twitchiness of the market. So, the the market becomes relative, it becomes quite twitchy as uh, as it starts second guessing uh, whether uh, prices are too high out there in the market. And so, what you tend to see, what you see within some of these products is uh, is something called a volatility overlay. And what they say to you is look. As we start seeing volatility increasing in the market, as we start seeing the market getting a bit twitchy, we'll actually start reducing the participation that you've got, um, and it can be, you know, it, it can fall right down to, to zero in some cases. Um, and then the idea being that as uh, as volatility then reduces and nervousness comes back out of the market, that uh, that they increase your exposure back to the market again. 
it's a bit different to the CPPI and threshold managed um, example I was giving you as coming out the market and going back in in that there isn't these um, selling at one point and buying in at a higher point it's uh, it's just really just looking at uh, how twitchy the market is at any one time and so I'd expect to see if I'm seeing a volatility overlay within within the product um, I would expect to see that the fees for that type of product comes down a little bit as well the term uh, so if you think about it a certain amount has got to go into this term deposit which is going to give you your capital guarantee at the end if you reduce the term so let's say you reduce it down from five years down to three years well there's obviously less time for you to earn interest on that portion of it and so you'd have to put more money into the term deposit side and less money into the actual investment um, to, to get that guarantee okay so again if you're looking at two products and uh, one's a shorter term expect to see uh, less bells and whistles on it income uh, I suppose it's an important point this is uh, whether it's fixed or conditional um, again you, you can see these products with uh, that, that will give you a fixed uh, a fixed income along the way there um, I think this is really as a as to provide an alternative for investors who are looking at um, money sitting in a term deposit. So you know, if you're sitting there getting five, six percent a year on term deposit, you might not be too happy with that. You might say, okay, well, let's. I'll go into one of these capital protected products, and it's going to give me a, a a minimum return of four percent a year for the next five years. I'm not really giving up much by being in this product versus a term deposit, and I might get a little bit more out of it as well. Um, the thing to watch out for though is whether the income is fixed or conditional uh, a good example of this is one of the, the big banks last year had a uh, fixed uh, sorry had a income element to their product uh, gave you four percent a year income but on looking at it twice you you'd realize that it's actually conditional and it was conditional on the investment rising ten percent a year um, so it, let's say it returned your investment had returned five percent in the first year, or the market risen five percent. Then obviously you've not got your four percent within that year. Uh, but the second year, let's say the re market had returned thirty uh, percent. I think the misconception amongst investors is that they're going to get their four percent for that year plus the four percent from the year before. That's just not the case. You is is considered on a year by year basis. Counterparty risk. Uh, counterparty, the easiest way of thinking of that is um, they're the people who are guaranteeing the investment. So um, uh, again, going back to my term deposit analogy, if you're going and putting money into a bank, so separate to this, you're just putting money into a bank on a term deposit, your counterparty is the bank. If the bank goes out of business and we didn't have the government guarantee as it stands at the moment, um, then you're at the mercy of, uh, of whether or not they've got funds available to pay you back your term deposit and it's the same within these types of structures um, within the bond and call you've got you've you just got to be careful that the product provider um, sorry the product provider isn't necessarily the counterparty and so just have a look uh, you might find that the counterparty is uh, a different bank behind it all um, it will say within the P PDS and um, it's unusual to see uh, somebody who isn't uh, a well-known brand behind that so it's generally not not a huge risk but um, all in all it's uh, it is the risk that's associated with this type of product CPPI or threshold management um, how to compare those products well that's okay so if we're looking at two CP CPPI products well the first thing to understand within these is that generally speaking they're only protected if you purchase a put option so they'll say to you look we try and protect your products so however if we don't pull your money out of the, the investment at the right time we got it a little bit late there's potentially there could be a shortfall there so it's um, uh, it's an attempt at protection rather than uh, real protection however if you've purchased the, uh, the put option uh, best way of thinking of put option it's an insurance policy so 
if you've purchased their insurance policy that goes with it, they say to you, okay, well, if we got if we didn't get it quite right and we didn't pull you out at the right time, then as long as you've got that put option, that insurance policy, we'll make up the the shortfall. So just bear that in mind when when you're looking at these products. If um, uh, at the end of the day, it's only if you're buying the put option that you've got real protection within it. Counterparty risk is similar. To counterparty risk is similar to in the bond and call structures. Who's um, who's actually the counterparty behind the the insurance policy with the put option? Investment managers tend to be the the biggest reason as to why you would choose the choose one provider over another. It's not that you're switching between managers throughout the term. You typically you're you're in one investment fund. You stay with that investment manager, that that fund right the way through the term. Um, it's just that uh, you know one provider might have an investment with platinum the other provider doesn't have access to platinum um, and so we tend to find that a lot of investors uh, choose their provider based on the fund manager who's, who's looking after the money volatility of the underlying investment um, the reason this is uh, um, and, and where, where I mean the volatility of the underlying investment I mean when you're making your choice as to which fund to invest your money in not not who's providing the protection but who's the individual manager looking after the money? This is an important factor because if you go back to my example earlier, let's just go. So go back to this example of um, the buys and sell triggers. If you think about it, you're selling low and you're buying in at a higher point. Um, so you want to avoid hitting these tr triggers as much as possible. And some of the investment managed funds out there have done exceptionally well. However, if you look at them, they go up and down a lot more than some of the other products. So they, over a period of time, they they might be going, uh, they might be going up like this. But if you look at how they do on a day-to-day -day basis, they might be very volatile and going up and down significantly, and hitting these buys and sell triggers every every step of the way. And every time you hit one of these triggers, it's costing you, uh, costing you money. Finally, the term. So the term of the investment actually impacts when you buy and sell triggers come along as well. So short-term products, and this it's unlikely you'd see a three-year type products with this because you would just um, automatically be hitting those sell triggers as the fund goes up and up and down. Um, so just be aware that the closer you get to maturity uh, and the closer you are to that protection level, uh, the more likely you are to hit these buy and sell triggers. Okay, so the next step uh, following on from this is really to then look at uh, the different structures in the market and we look at the um, what have been the problematic structures going through the GFC. Uh, we've highlighted some of the, the main providers out there and um, uh, what to look for in terms of your existing investments if you already have them and how to assess whether or not you have a problematic um, capital protected product. Thanks for your time and uh, see you on the next presentation.